so we are talking. What? Well, we just no, I said that's the mail. Here, I'll, I'll show. I'll show you. I'll show you. We're going to. This is. This is. Okay, here it is. It's it's a minute. It's a minute and 10. It's a minute and 10 okay, seconds. It's okay. Worth it. It's worth it. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Wait, can you hear it or not? Can you hear it at home? No, I hear an echo from you. Yeah, I know. Hold it a second. Yes, yeah, because you because Facebook is open. All right, sorry. Okay, let's try it again. Oh wait, I think I need to share sound. Okay, here we go. Moses, this is the law thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Nothing, I vanished. Forget it. Oh, Lord, why have you chosen me? What would you have me do for you? Laws, and you shall take them unto the people. Yes, Lord. I don't think there's a way for me to stop. It's too sad. Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. <laughs> ten, ten commandments. To to obey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's the... oh, it's just there. What's even funnier is what was written, right? Yeah, so good one, Ray. Good one. <laughs> so, we so what we did this last time, which I've never done before because it just shows you, you know, what you do in Torah study is uh, we found out what was on those 15 commandments. Uh, and so let me just see if I can put it. Remember? Well, yeah, we just saw it yesterday. So, oh. but what I caught, is, so the whole point was, is that on here, here's how we got on the discussion. The biblical Hebrew text in the Ten Commandments in the movie was real biblical Hebrew. Oh. Okay. On the ten. On the ten in, in the Charlton Heston. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. In the Mel Brooks one, he was holding up commandments that were that were uh, written in our Hebrew, Aramaic Hebrew, which is old, but it's not biblical Hebrew. Okay. It's not the Hebrew of, of um, what scribes wrote in, in the Ten Commandments, which is why, which is why, um, which is why I showed it last time. So that's the Hebrew that we have, right? That's our Hebrew. But that's not biblical Hebrew. Oh. Biblical Hebrew looks much different. So I was saying how this is real Hebrew. So I was looking at the Hebrew and I said, I couldn't read out the first line, but I saw this next one. It said, Lo tiz, or Lo tizchak, which means don't laugh. <laughs> and then this one says, Lo tikne, which means don't buy. And what we think it says is you shall not buy, right? It says right here, you shall not buy, which is, of course, a joke, which is it says you shall not buy retail. <laughs> Yeah, so low top four, you shall not pass. So you can you can figure out what the rest of the rest of the pass was. I don't know, but this this was uh, so we don't, we're not exactly sure. But this last one is probably low tisha bear, which means you shall not break. Which of course is what he does in the next scene. <laughs> is the tablet? But the third no, we're not sure. We're not sure what it says. Is it says low tal low talunu? uh well we don't know like don't stay you know don't stay at someone's house too long i don't know what is what they sat around discussing but i do think it is it is something to talk about uh 
if we ever do get to talk to Mel Brooks, what, where, how did he come up with those things? Because we want to know. We can say to him, we, Mel, we need to know what were on the other five commandments so that, we, that, we, that we didn't get to see. So anyways, that was the Ten Commandments. So we are going to read that story in the, uh, we're going to read that story in the Torah uh, next week or the week after. We're going to actually read that. We're going to read that story. But yeah, so we, the last thing we... Get 10 then. In, in yes, the we'll, we'll only get the 10. We're, we're, wow. we're going back to the, uh, yeah, we're going back to the only the 10, the 10 that we've got. But uh, yeah, this is an important part of our, let me just go back to, go back to that page. Um, so that's where we are. We're, we finish the commandments and we get the, we get the uh, rest of the commandments. We get the commandments that we have been reading over the last couple of weeks. I, I just keep saying, hey, there's more commandments, right? This isn't just the 10 commandments, but whatever happens, he goes up onto the mountain to get the commandments. Right. And so the last thing we read is that he's up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The next text that we're reading today begins, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, and now we're going to get into the, um, <laughs> we're getting into the, to the uh, construction of the, of the tabernacle, which takes up from chapter 25, pretty much until the end of the book of the ex of Exodus, the whole rest of the book, with the exception of like three chapters, which are the getting the Ten Commandments and the Golden Calf. So, in the middle of of this is the Golden Calf story. Um, so we're going to get these few. few we're going to read. Normally, we read like two chapters. Today, we're going to read like five. Because we're. I can't. We can't. Because some people haven't read it, Mike. You've read it. You've read it a few times. Now, there's five chapters about what you're supposed to do. Here's the problem. Here's what Mike's talking about. There's five portion, there's five chapters, two portions. The next five portions, we're gonna, five chapters we're going to do today are about what you're supposed to do with building the Mishkan. Then there's the, the three chapters that talk about the golden calf and when Moses comes down, and then they actually build it, which is about another five chapters. So there's like 14, 13 more chapters, and 10 of them are about the, the Mishkan. Yeah. And the five chapters at the end are almost a direct repetition of these, uh -huh. which is a whole nother question. Like, why do we have to have it twice? It's almost like we get the detail the first time. Why do we have to get it a second time? So here's an important point. There are 10 chapters roughly about the construction of the Mishkan. Yeah. There are 30 verses about the creation of the world, chapter one of Genesis. But there are 30 chapters about the creation of the Mishkan. So it gives you a little idea of what the Torah is really about. The Torah is really not about the creation of the world. It's not about the mechanics of the world. But it is very important how the people are supposed to pray, how they're supposed to worship. More importantly, again, how they're supposed to sacrifice. So this is a description of the sacrificial area, the area that they're going to worship in, and in the desert. And then for the first almost 200 years, that they're in the promised land, they're in the same, they're using the same thing. They're using the tabernacle. So it, it's it's very important. It's very important to the priests. It's very important to the people. It's clearly very important because so much of the Torah is based on that. And again, it's the last section of Exodus. So let's just say one thing too about Exodus as we get into this last third of Exodus. Exodus can be seen as three separate things that go on in. They and I didn't invent this theory. This has been talked about more recently, but it is it's been talked about before. The first part about Exodus is our time in Egypt as slaves, our oppression. The next third that we just finished is about freedom and the law. And the last third is about the way that we pray. So there's three different ideas in there that are very important for our formulation and essentially our creation as a people, which is to talk about why we were slaves, how we were slaves, how we got liberated and got the law. And then the last thing is, is how, how we pray. And those are the different sections that kind of set us up for who we are. What? No, but they did. And the people who read this and the people who wrote it, and the people who taught it and the people who were obsessed with it 
these three things had to all go together because they're all connected. Freedom leads to the law and leads to now the ability to, uh, as free people, as people who are bound by a covenant, are now going to worship as a people. They Does needed it. it. Contribute to our longevity as a people in any way. Yeah. Well, I would say that all three of those kind of are the four, are they're, they're part of our formation as a people yeah. because other people have other narratives of how they became a people. Ours are rooted in these three three sections of, of Exodus, right? But is the how we worship still contributing in some way that well, we're let's not see. aware of? Well, let's see. Okay. I would say yes, and I would say that it's probably, it's probably we're going to point out those pieces that are relevant, okay. obviously. Sure. Those are the things that we're going to be thinking about the most. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Don't worship when you're supposed to. Uh, you can get killed. Some, what we read, uh, That's not freedom to me. Uh, well, it's freedom. It, there, you still have the ability as a free person to make that choice. There's going to be consequences for it, but there's consequences for it. But the consequences, interestingly, are not are not arbitrary. The problem is if you're a slave, you wake up and every day you could have a new set of laws because it's whatever your master decides you're going to do. With God, you know what the rules are. You know what the expectations are. And so the hope is, is that by, if you will, giving thanks for our freedom, giving thanks for our uh, protection, whatever you want to call it, our, our covenant, all those things, then we, then if we can't, it, look, this last part to some extent is about our ability to express ourselves for where we've, where we've gotten to, which is that we started out as slaves, then we're free, took on the laws, and now we express our thanks for who we are. So there's like a little thing in there, right? This is, this is like all, who we are as a people. So Genesis is kind of who we are as a family, who we are as a, you know, who we are as a family. This is who we are as a people. This is our national identity. And our national identity is rooted in the fact that we were slaves, that we became free and took on the law, and that now we also felt that there was a, a we have to figure out a way to express our connection to God. And I wouldn't just say gratitude. Because it really is more than that. It's really about our connection to God. It's how to, we, we understand that those two things are how we got to where we are, but now we have to figure out how to keep that connection. And to some extent, the worship, whatever it is, is our connection. But let's look at it. Let's look at it in specifically. And I, and I will tell you that some of the most important, relevant, I don't say important, but the most relevant connections are right at the beginning. So we're going to get into it. And we're already 15 minutes in, but I will tell you, don't be surprised because this is really setting it up and we get it almost right away. So God spoke to Moses saying, is the way this begins and a lot of the rest of the Torah begins. God spoke to Moses saying, tell the Israelite people to bring me gifts. You shall accept gifts for me from every person whose heart is so moved. Arguably the most important line in the whole rest, <laughs> the whole rest of the day we just got. <laughs> This is where the words truma, which is the name of the portion, come from. Truma says right here, this Hebrew word, which is the fifth word, or it's the fifth word of the second line. So you take out these four or five lines that are four or five words that are, you know, God spoke to Moses saying, and you get all the way to this word, which is truma, which is the word here for gifts. Bring me gifts, right? And you shall accept the gifts from everyone whose heart is moved, which means this is a free will gift. People don't have to give. This isn't compelled. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the interesting thing is, is for the first place that the people will ever worship as Jews, as we worship ever as a people, as a family, as a, as more than a family, as a, as a nation, as a, as a 
as a group, when a group of people got together to worship as Jews, we said, everybody bring what you want to bring. I'm not, here's what, we're going to get the list of what you can bring. Like there is details to this, but if you want to bring this, good. If not, don't have to give. Which means that it's a free will offering. Nobody's forced. And that this place was built out of love. Not because people were told, this is what you're owed. Now, this is a vibrant and loving and very different experience than what the Jews find themselves in hundreds of years later, as those who are in the book of Kings with us have seen. When Solomon builds the temple, he doesn't give people a choice. Not only does he not give them a choice, it says he placed taskmasters over them to build it, which is the only time that we ever see that word is that Pharaoh set taskmasters over us. So he compelled people to work, cutting timber, making quarrying rocks for it. He did not give people a choice. Everybody had to build the temple, whether they wanted to or not, which probably created some resentment, which is why he put taskmasters over them. Because if he just said, hey, everybody bring me your stuff, we're going to build a temple, it would have been a different experience. That's not what happens uh, here. Here it is. Bring me what you want by what your own heart gives you the need to do. Where did this stuff come from? Where's this stuff coming from? Ah, uh, these gifts are going to be, you accept from them, shall be gold, silver, and copper, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, fine linen, goat's hairs, tanned ram skins. Here's our famous tachash, tachashim. <laughs> dolphin skins and acacia wood oil for lighting spices for anointing oil and for aromatic incense lapis lazuli and other stones for setting for the ephod and for the breast piece where do they get all this stuff from they're out in the desert where do they get it from they took it from the egyptians it says they left with all the stuff from the Egyptians. So you want to know where it went? According to the Torah, this is where they had it. This is why they had it. They had it for just this moment. Now, dolphin skins is an interesting one because, again, we're not sure exactly that it's what it is. Sometimes it's not even translated. What does your translation have? Somebody, glory. What does yours have, Mary? Badger skins. King James, we do. We talk about Tahash when it 3,200 years ago, 1200 BCE. What? 1200 years? No, 1200 years BCE. So 3,200 years ago. This is the time of Moses. What does your translation say? Sea cows, manatees. That's weird. But at least it's closer. It's closer. To Here's that, yeah. So here's the issue. People have always been kind of taken by what the word tachash means, this word right here, tachashim. Uh, we thought for a long time that it was badger skins or some other kind of animal, you know, some animal that we weren't really exactly sure what it was. It was definitely a, some kind of skin. But people really didn't think, they knew that it maybe was a sea animal. The issue was, is they never thought there's any way possible that it could have been a dolphin skin. And then it turned out that we found an archeological dig in the desert, not far from the, not in Israel, but in, in a dome in the area by Petra, they found an archeological dig that attested to dolphin skins that were used in the desert. Why? Because they don't have dolphins in the desert and they're very, very expensive. It's the equivalent of having a chinchilla fur because that we don't have a lot of chinchillas here or sable or whatever weird kind of animal you, you use for a fur if you don't have those animals nearby. So the value of it was in the fact that it was rare. So if they use these rare dolphin skins, which is why the translation that they use here is uh, dolphin skins in a more modern translation, uh, sometimes they don't even translate it. In, in the Orthodox translations, they use the word tzachash. 
by itself without translating it. Uh, some people are bothered by the tahash being dolphin because it's not a, a kosher animal. So they don't like the idea. Badgers aren't really kosher either, but um, they don't like the idea that this would be a non-kosher animal. Rams and goats are all kosher. She's got C, it C, says C man. Cow, but the, my footnote says, is that kosher? No. Oh, right. No. It says the, um, the wool had been removed from the skins. The final product was similar to present day Morocco leather. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Oh, look, manatees would be very expensive too because they also don't have manatees in the desert. So the possibility that this is some kind of very expensive cloth, some people say, well, that doesn't make sense. It should have been something that they could have gotten easily. Look, they couldn't get the rest of this stuff very easily. They couldn't get blue and purple and crimson yarns and gold and silver very easily. So why couldn't it be something valuable? So again, different arguments. And that's why some people don't even translate it. They <laughs> just use the word tachash to say, let's not, let's not get into an argument over it. So this is what they brought. So we're about to get a very detailed list of what they brought. This is just what kinds of stuff they brought. We're going to get into the dimensions in a moment. But here's, in verse 8, another really important line. And one would argue, again, maybe the most famous line. Be, well, the other line's pretty good, too. By, your heart, by whatever your heart moves you, it's a great line, right? Because we would use that line today, right? If we told people, make a donation, but make it by how your heart moves you. But this line is so beautiful that it's used all across the world on synagogue art and synagogue uh, paintings and synagogue. Um, it's over the synagogues of, of all around the world, across this country and around the world. You'll see this line in Hebrew. And usually it's translated too, unless they don't want to. Va'asuli mikdash v'shachanti b'tocham. It's a line that everybody should know. Let me make a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God says, I want to dwell among them. Now, of course, God lives everywhere. God is everywhere. So why does God say, I want to be amongst the people through the sanctuary that I build? So again, the word um, shachanti right here, is the root for the word mishkan, which is what we call the place, the tabernacle. It's kind of a weird word, tabernacle. We use the word sanctuary. We use the word holy. You know, it's the holy space, the holy tent. Um, but it, the word is the root for a neighbor, somebody who lives close by, somebody who's with you, somebody who's around you. It's also the root for the word shekhinah, which is the divine presence which is something that's near you, something that's manifest in our, in our space, in our space. So God wants to be amongst the people, which is why we build the sanctuary. So that's why people put that up on their sanctuaries today. So you can look around the world and see those lines all around the world in the in sanctuary. So we still try to figure that out, how to do that. So there's an interesting discussion about like, why does God need a special place, right? Doesn't, is God, if God's all around us all the time, what do we need a place to create for God? So there's a very famous uh, Hasidic, it's not even a story, it's, it's a discussion, not even discussion, it's two lines. Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, who lived in the 19th century, said to his disciples, where's God? And they said, well, God's everywhere. And he said, no, God's where you let him in. So there was this understanding that we had in, in like Hasidic Judaism and going back to maybe even to the Torah that, yeah, God is everywhere, but is God really present unless we open the door? So the weird thing is, is that we have to create that space for God. It's not like, it's there automatically in our consciousness unless we do it. We have the free will to do that. That's the weird thing about our connection, in, in at least that we teach in Judaism, is that, yeah, God's always there. I mean, we, it's like if you believe in God, then God's there whether you believe it or not. But if a person 
says, hey, I have no room for God in my life, then they really haven't created a space. They haven't created a space for God to come in. So that's the, that's the interesting teaching about this in Judaism, which is, yeah, God is there. God is inside of you. God's aware. But you really haven't made a space for holiness in your life unless you decide you, you're going to do that. But that's a choice. People make that choice. God doesn't force that on us. So that's where the freedom comes from. So, Mike, you raised the issue. Does God compel us to keep Shabbat? Well, there's a consequence if we don't keep Shabbat, but clearly we have free will. So it doesn't say, I will make the sanctuary. It says, let them make the sanctuary. So the, the onus, the responsibility is on us. They'll make the sanctuary. I'm not going to make the sanctuary. They make the sanctuary. So that's a critical line. That line eight is also one of the critical lines. Line two and line eight. So now we're going to get into the details. Now you're going to say, what do we need these details for? Here's the line. Exactly as I show you the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, so shall you make it. And now we're going to get, that's the, that's the entryway into this detail. Exactly as I show you, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. And now we're going to get into the dimensions. So why do we have this? Line by line we're about to get into. I could ask you the question after we already read it, but I want you not to glaze over as we read this. So think about this. One of the teachings, and again, I don't know where it started from, but one of the teachings from, from uh, Rabbi Saul Berman, who is an Orthodox slash conservative teacher for many generations in, uh, in New York, at Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, he taught that the reason that we have these details for the Mishkan is because human nature being what it is, if you don't tell people exactly what to do when they build something, they'll build what they want. It's not only they'll build what they want. If Moses didn't get told exactly what to do and what was going to be used, what happens? If you give somebody, if you tell somebody, I want to build a house, and you don't tell them really, you know, you just say, go build me a house. I, I want a house. Maybe I want it, you know, I want it in the backyard. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. Nobody does that. Well, first of all, why would you do that? Because the person who you told to build a house would do whatever they want. And not only that, they charge whatever they want. And there would be missing money all over the place. Mike, you have? No, absolutely. God's yeah. 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 God gives you like. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone wrote this down. Yep. If someone built it and then took the measurements and wrote that down. Could be. Yeah. There's probably a priest who is very detail oriented. Right. But the reason that we still study today is, is maybe the important takeaway lesson, which is why I said it before we actually read it which is why you could say it's repeated again, that there's an accounting for it, right? Because the last two portions by Akel Pekude are the accounting of it. And a lot of people say, why did Moses have to do an accounting for it? For exactly that reason. Because God gave exact explicit instructions on what you were supposed to do. And then Moses went ahead and did it. Because if you don't do things that way, people lie and they cheat and they don't do what they're supposed to do. Now you could say... Exactly. Now you could say, well, but that's not fair. Well, okay, but that's life. That's what happens. If you if 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 you tell somebody, hey, go give me a bid on this project, and you don't check that bid, well, that's on you for not being responsible, but it's also an open invitation for there to be graft and for there to be unaccountable unaccounted expenses. Next. 15 chapters or so, really is a lesson. Some would say that it's a lesson for, especially when you deal with stuff for the construction of holy purposes, right. that you don't mess around. Well, actually, it could be a lesson for anything. Yeah. We, we have continuously learned this lesson. 
Yeah. I will tell you, uh, our biggest problem with 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 our synagogue is that we we obviously we have deferred maintenance that we sometimes don't want to take care of, but even when we take care of it, uh, I'm just going to use this as an example. Harvey's on the line. Harvey was president last, more, most recently, but John was president in pr previous years. Look, we just had this great fence that was ex installed on our synagogue three years ago, four years, three or four years ago. Three years ago. Two people just came in here to today to tell me that it didn't work. The door was stuck. After two or three years, the gate shouldn't be stuck. It wasn't done right. Doesn't, what? That's on us, but that's a different story, Mike. It's connected though. It's connected because that's what happens when you have different administrations and different leaders that, that, that inherit a project. But look, the person who put up the fence should be accountable for the fact that it's not working properly after three years. I, look, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know which person. I don't know which person has the contract. I, I think I, I think I know, but it doesn't look, it doesn't really matter. And I don't want to, I don't want to pick on one person in particular. Look, I don't want to get into this, but I brought it up. So I invited it. And I will tell you that this is why this stuff is relevant. That's all my point is, is that there was, we are, this just happened. I'm not saying this didn't happen 1,200 years ago. This happened three years ago that we had a construction. I'm not sure where the contract is. Obviously, we should have a file where all the work that we've ever done in the synagogue is accessible. Right. It's not. Right. It's not. John, I can I, I can I can only tell you that I have never seen a file I have never seen a file on the on the maintenance on this on the work that's been done on this congregation. But do you understand? Like if somebody said if somebody asked the question, when was the last time the roof got repaired? We just repaired the roof. We just did. I don't know if in five years from now when somebody says, hey, the roof got repaired, because I heard at the last board meeting. That the roofer told us that the next time the roof gets repaired, it's going to have to be pulled up and they have to put a new roof on. Now I heard that. Yeah, you know, it Whatever. I'm just telling you, all of these are now bubble mices. These are all stories that are going to be passed on to the to the next to two generate the two new boards, two boards from now are going to hear that story. And who knows the way that story is going to be passed down. But I'm telling you, this happens all the time. So the reality is, is that. 3,200 years ago, someone gave Moses, right. and you're right, Mike, it was probably written 2,800 years ago, but guess what? I'm not going to quibble over 2,800 years. For 2,800 years, people have been reading over this over and over and over again as a lesson for how you're supposed to, especially when it comes to the, the creation, the maintenance, the ongoing building of sacred space. Because if people have donated money to that, that's something you have to treat very, very special. Yeah, that's it. What am I going to say? Uh, all right, so let's read the details because <laughs> that's the lesson, folks, exactly as I show you. Yeah. This is what happens. This is life. All right, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. So we start off with the ark, the creation of the ark, right? We start off with, if you will, the holiest piece first, right. the smallest piece first, and so to some extent, because it's only two and a half cubits long, which is roughly three feet and a cubit and a half wide, right? Which is about a foot and a half wide and a cubit and a half high. Yeah, about a foot and a half, about the length from your pinky down to your down to your elbow. So about a cubit and a half, right? So the dimensions of that are again, uh, it's a it's a it's a oval. I mean, an oval, a rectangle box, mm -hmm. right? And you can see it's about three feet by a foot and a half. Not very big, the ark. It's not that big. Now it is going to be laid in with gold, 
overlay it with pure gold, right? Overlay it inside and out and make upon it gold mounting, molding right around about. Now, why, why that's so important. So we said we're not going to have every line. Turns out every line is important, right? No, this line right here is, is another one of those lines. No, no, no. But no, that's connected to that, right? That's a bigger issue, which John just brought up. But I thought you meant this line. Why is it, why is it got to be gold inside and out? It doesn't deteriorate. It isn't affected by rust or weather. Uh -huh. it, it'll last forever. And no one's going to see that inside and out. They'll see the outside, but they won't see the inside. But the point is, is that you don't skimp on what people can't see. Right? You got to make the whole thing special. This is not a facade. This is not, this is not going to be something that, well, we look inside and we go, oh, yeah, we, we skimped on that. We have nice skin, but they don't put mashed potatoes inside. Now, now I, will I will tell you this. I will tell you this, this is where, you know, you, you, you get into the commentaries on this. So if you see, uh, no, not that one. Uh, I'm, I should look here, not on, the, I'm looking at the screen, not on my computer. Here it is, says, um, what does it say? What was the Rashi one here? Um, no, it basically says the same thing. Um, yeah, it's, there's no other commentary, but again, it's supposed to be a lesson that, you know, it's the inside counts too. It's not just what people see, right? It's on the inside. So the inside and out is, you know, our character should be covered in gold, both, you know, the things that people see and the, and the, and, and the stuff about us inside should also be gold of good quality, right? Um, so has four rings on it to be attached to its four feet, two rings on one side of its walls and two sides on the others, which is why Mike in the back there is, going to be pointing to the two rings on our ark just right behind him right so when when uh, joe renson wanted to build an ark a portable ark for our temple we put rings on it so that we could have it just like that we he, could, uh, ask for that. he was in torah study all the time he was in torah study all the time yes everyone so he he knew and uh, he always he always was interested in the construction of the, of the ark and, that, and those kind of things and that's why, of course, we also have poles of acacia wood. Now, ours aren't ours aren't acacia, but they're similar kind of wood to acacia wood. Overlay them with gold. Now, acacia wood is a kind of wood that you find primarily in the desert. So you can get acacia even in California, but it's not. Is it a hard wood? It's it's not a it's not the hardest wood. Let's put it that way. But it is a, it is a strong wood for the desert. Let's okay. put it that way. Yeah. That is so important to me. Put those two things together, the P and I, right? Mm -hmm. I never knew that. Yeah. So the emotions that go together with that, that's what's really hitting me right now. Yeah. So so when we had that, you know, and I remember the first year that we we brought it out, you know, he helped bring it out, that that became part of look, it's been we've had it for 12. 14, 12 or 14, 2000, I think it's 14 years. I think it's 2008. Okay. So if you think about it, um, I don't know how much longer it'll last. We tried to take good care of it. Um, it Look, it's not, it's hard to say. It's, it's not as valuable or as, as irreplaceable as the Taurus, but it's pretty important. I, I, I treat the arc, our arc that we have as a pretty important thing to protect. Um, because yeah, you know, at one point, at some point in the future, we won't be able to use it anymore, but I'm very, I'm very hopeful that the style that it was built will continue. Like this thing will continue to have that arc with the poles. I don't know many people who've done that either, but it's, listen, it, it is, it's not as, um, if the, if the, if the hooks on the outside of them weren't there, it would, it would be a little, maybe a little bit less, uh, Maybe it'd be more attractive if it didn't have the hooks, but the hooks are what makes it. What makes it attractive? It's what makes it the the arc. The, the nexus. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. The, 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 yeah. In fact, I, I think it needs to be explained. It's the first time. So, interestingly, I'm going to show you because you brought it up. Um. 
there is actually, um, these are the hooks. So we had one break once, one of those hooks broke. So I had to find some place that would, uh, that made these the exact ones. So I found them and we got, we got two, I got two, I got an extra one. So, so in case it, another one breaks that we have it. So yeah, that's a piece of, that's a piece of, of that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, the arc, our arc, that arc works really well. That was, I did it with uh, Kaz once. Well, it's funny because when you think about it, right? But 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 the but the um but it is. I I would. Yeah. I'm I'm sad. This is the first time I'm hearing about. It. All right. Well, I thought I thought you knew. I would. Know. I will have to teach people again this year. We don't listen. We don't talk about the arc a lot at, at high holidays, but it is definitely something that uh, we could teach a, a modern day lesson. We'll do that next year. We'll remind people of how that arc was was built. And uh, um, yeah, so that is that is the the uh, those are the the um, the rings. Saw those those rings so um assumedly those rings had to be pretty strong too because those rings had the weight to, to some extent the weight is being you know is, is kind of like those hooks have to carry the weight on them because like our our arc is not that heavy. like this these broke not because this broke not because of the, it was being carried by the arc it broke because you know, somebody, it was lying on something in someone's car probably and it, and it, um, you know, it broke. The interesting thing is, is it broke. It didn't break the arc. It didn't break the wood. The metal broke. It's weird, but anyways, you have to think that those, that those hooks had to be, those, those poles and those hooks had to be um, very, very strong. Because if you think about it, if they were just solid gold, they're very malleable and they must have been like really had to have really they had to be really strong um so that they could be it could bear the weight on that right so it says the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark they shall not be removed from it which means that they didn't normally they weren't supposed to be removed um and deposit in the ark the tablets of the pact which i will give you because of course at this point he doesn't have them yet but we actually get the box or get the dimensions of the box before we get the commandments. So I'm going to give it to you, and here's where you put them. So there's actually an interesting lesson here, of course, which is that God will tell us, give us the directions for things sometimes before we have them so that we're prepared for them, right? We have to be prepared. And so we get the dimensions of the ark before we actually have them. You shall make a cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, Make two cruvim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the cover. And so we'll show that real quick when we're, I mean, let's finish this uh, when we're done. I'm assuming it's this time, right? Because my hair piece, okay. That uh, this is the hardest metal known. Gold? Uh, it's a good question. First of all, you know, in 14 carats, it's harder than 18. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. It is. Yeah, and They're, platinum is harder than gold. Right? Yes, they didn't have it in. I'm, I'm sorry to get on these tangents. No, no. I, I will. Uh, let's 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 put it this way. There probably was a. There probably was a. Um, there probably was a. Um, um, an alloy, a gold alloy that they used for the things that needed to be stronger. It's probably not pure gold. One second, let me let me put up the picture of the uh, the arc for one. Oh, let me finish. Let's finish the cruvim first. So it says um, there's two of the cruvim. These are the angels. They're on top. Now here's the weird question that John already asked. It talked about not making images in gold, specifically not making images of gold. And here we have images of gold. 
make one kruv, uh, one of the cherubs at one end and one of the kruvim at the other end of one piece with the cover, you shall make the kruvim at its two ends. The kruvim shall have their wings spread out above, shielding the cover with their wings. They shall confront each other, the faces of the kruvim being turned toward the cover. So let's look at that real quick uh, so that everybody can see the, the uh, arc. Let me just post it up. Um, and how is this not idolatry? Um, good question. Let's look at them. Well, we haven't got that law yet. Yeah, we did. We had the Ten Commandments. That's right. We 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 got them. And again, for those who remember the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you can see uh, this version of them. Oh my! Yeah. So there's the poles. So the dimensions again about. Uh, foot and a half, and then about three feet. Well, then, in other words, the Torahs really weren't that tall. No, oh, you mean the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Not the Torah. Yeah. This is the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments would have fit inside here easily. How big they were, they fit inside here. Now, here are the Kruvim up the top. So these are winged angels. They're facing each other with their wings touching, which is what the Torah describes. So whenever you see that described, the wings are touching and the faces are facing each other. They're not facing out, they're facing in. Uh, and this was not considered idolatry. So however this was supposed to be understood, this was okay. So of course it begs the question, why is this okay, but the golden calf not okay because they didn't really worship necessarily calves they worshiped the thing that went on the calf which was their gods uh they didn't worship the angels they worshiped what was above the angels which were was god god's presence so the angels weren't worshiped it was what's above them which is god yes any idol yeah. You were not supposed to get any type of idols. Yeah. So how are these not idols? I don't know. They, don't know. they are uh, acceptable forms of divine representation. Why? Uh, again, because they're not gods on themselves to the, as themselves. They're worshiped. They're protecting. Mm -hmm. They're carrying God. Mm -hmm. They're what God rides on. So when you see them, you're supposed to think about the fact that God is above them and there is no depiction of that. Right. And that's where the... This is an exception to the rule. Well, it's more of this is what makes this unusual, which is, yeah, they're what, but what makes this important to why I mentioned with the golden calf is it's a similar thing, which is that the golden calf also didn't have anything on it. The difference is, is that when Aaron makes the golden calf, which we're going to see very shortly, he says, this is your God, Israel. Mm. And so that seems to be what the issue is, is that they actually worship the calf, or they say that they're worshiping the calf. But we also talked about the fact, and you're not there, Joanne, that the calves, the golden calves are what Jeroboam built in his kingdom, probably with a similar understanding that God isn't the calf, God is on top of the calves. There's one calf in, in Bethel, and there's another calf in, D in Dan, and God is on top of the whole country. So they didn't worship the calf. They worshiped the fact that God was sitting over their whole country on top of those calves. So the person who wrote that in Exodus knew what they were writing. They knew they were writing a polemic against golden calves. But did the people of Israel in the north think that the golden calves were gods? Probably not, just like these people didn't think that these were gods. I will tell you, when we look at this and we go, well, those are idols. Okay, that's our, by our standard, those are idols. Okay? I'm not saying that we're right or we're wrong or they were wrong or they were, but they clearly didn't think these were idols. They knew what they were doing. They knew that they had the Ten Commandments. 
they knew that the Ten Commandments were very explicit about making idols. They didn't think these were idols. That I know. Gloria. Um, my footnote says, in the Old Testament, the cherubim were symbolic attendants that marked the place of the Lord and enthronement in his earthly kingdom. Yeah, so he's on top of them. They're like the throne for God. God sits on top of them. Or God stands on top. God's on top. They're the chariot. They're the throne. They're the they're what God rides upon. They're they're attendance to God, but they're not God. So that's what they believe. So if they believe that, then look, we can get into this discussion, and there are definitely it's definitely important because again, it's not going to be in necessarily glory, glory in the translation, but look, does do representations of Jesus, are they idols? Now, Christians definitely didn't believe they were idols because they knew what was in the Ten Commandments. They knew that they weren't supposed to make idols. And so people didn't think that a crucifix was an idol. But Protestants and many other Christians over the years thought that a depiction of Jesus on a cross was an idol. Why? Because they didn't make Jesus on a cross. They had a cross. They didn't have Jesus on the cross. Now, the, part of the explanation is that's the risen Christ. That's not the Christ who suffers. It's the Christ who's now resurrected. But there's another issue there. There were people who absolutely said, you cannot have a, a Jesus on a cross. That's an idol. And they broke them. They didn't break them because they thought they were ugly. They broke them because they thought they were idols. So Christians had that issue too. We, bless you, we had an issue with idols. Nobody had an issue with that. That's all I can tell you. Um, we have an issue with it, which is why we say, why did our ancestors have those things? But, yeah, so, so right here, the Kruvim. And again, it is totally different than the word cherub in English, which is why I don't like to use the word cherub, because when we think about cherub, we think about a little angel with yeah, it's not it's, these are not what these angels look like these are not baby-faced angels those were christian interpretations or artistic representations of what cupid looked like and what it's in the say it's in the office it was too idolatrous no it's not it's not it's not too, some people we, we kind of took down some of the art anyways the point is is that it is acceptable at least in the biblical period. Now, what do these two things represent? One, yeah. Right. So, some priests or rabbi had to spin that. What? So, what do you mean spin it? That it was acceptable. No, they didn't. It's in the Torah. They didn't have to spin it. They had. They they have to say. Yeah, we don't make them, but our ancestors did. And part of it is that once the temple was destroyed then we don't dabble in that anymore. We don't dabble in it anymore. There are some synagogues that have put Kruvim in their artwork. Temple Eitz Chaim, which is a conservative synagogue in Thousand Oaks, have, has Kruvim around their art. It is very jarring to see. Does it look like that? Yeah, it looks like that. It looks like angels. Yeah, it looks like angels with, with wings. But it's, it's, it's jarring because we like it looks idolatrous. But it looked very contemporary in those days. Like that's what people had. But there weren't angel, they weren't baby-faced angels. That's, the, that's why the word cherub today doesn't even mean an angel. It just means like, you know, a baby-faced. Look, I'll show you. If we, if we look up at the word cherub, this is what we see. We see this. We see that. Right. That's what we think of when we think of cherub. Okay. But I think you got to be kind of tough to guard the ten commandments. Yes, which is why our cherubim were not; they were scary. Oh. So, so if we see, yes, if we look at what cherubs look like, <laughs> this is this is like more like what a cherub look like. In the based on the biblical description, that's what it looked like. This is these were Christian are icons based on what the Bible described, which are not quite as scary as those. Oh, this one's pretty scary too. That 
but based on based on the biblical description, that's kind of what Kruvim looked like, but not like this, not these little guys, not those guys, and that's what we that's what we think about when we think about cherubs, and so that that's why I don't even I use the word keruv, which is the Hebrew. Uh, interestingly, though, what's the one of the more modern interpretations of this? One of the more modern interpretations of Kruvim is that the two faces of the Kruvim are facing each other. And I think it's actually based on an on a, on a, on a ancient tradition, but it, it's definitely more of a modern thing that I'll hear, is that the two angels that were on top, the Kruvim that were there, one was male and one was female, meaning that the male and female aspects of the divine needed to be in balance. They both had to be represented. And when they were represented and they were equal, then that's where God was on top of that. That's why there was two, a male and female Keruv. The only thing is, is that we don't really have descriptions of female Kruvim. It doesn't mean that they weren't. Again, I think it's actually based on an older Midrash, but it's definitely a more modern one that you'll hear a lot when people talk about, you know, trying to be more egalitarian, is that the two Kruvim represent the male and female aspects of the divine and of people. All right. So it says, there I will meet you, and I will impart to you from above the cover, from between the two Kruvim that are on top of the Ark of the Pact, all that I will command you concerning the Israelite people. Somebody say some? No. Nope. You shall make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, one cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make a rim of a hand's breadth around it and make a gold molding for its rim about. Make four gold rings for it and attach the, four, the rings to the four corners of its four legs. The rings shall be next to the rim as holders for poles to carry the table. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. By these, the table shall be carried. That is the table. That is the shulchan the table that is used that you saw in the picture before, which I'll show you one more time. This is the table. So in this picture, you've got the altar, which we haven't gone to. We've got the table here. And then we've got the Holy of Holies, which is where you've got the ark inside that. So you don't see the ark yet. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's definitely more of a show table than a functional table, right? It's, you're supposed to put the, you're supposed to put the bread on it. You put the bread. You put the bread on it. Okay, so this is again. It's like the other stuff that we just read about. You put gold on it, right? You overlay it by gold, and it also has poles, and you carry it with the rings and the poles. Uh, you carry it. Uh, make its bowls, ladles, jars, jugs with which to offer libations. Make them of pure gold. And on the table, you shall sweat the bread of display to be before me always. So that is what we call the shoe bread. Glory, what is the, what is your uh, translation say? It's a note on 30. Does it say something about the bread on display? But the bread of the presence on the table to be before me at all times. That's it? Yeah. yeah, so this is called the lechem panim, which is the bread of display or the bread of the face. Uh, this is bread that's put out in front of God all the time. Footnote says show bread. Yeah, so I said the shoe bread. S-H-E-W or S-H-O-W. Yeah, what does yours say, Mary? S-H-E-W. So that's that's the it just means it's the translation of the bread on display. It's the word for panim. It means God, it's it's bread that's out there for constantly, as if to say this is for God. It is probably where we get our tradition of having a challah from. Because this bread is bread that we now represent is represented in our homes as the bread of display. For God. It's the way we turn our Shabbat tables into a altar for God, which is not what it's going to say in your translation, Glory, but
but it will say in other Orthodox Jewish translations, which are, this becomes the challah that we have on our tables for Shabbos. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that when we get to uh, what we have there too. But this is actually connected to something we read yesterday, which was about how the Moabites took a bunch of our special vessels and they took them away when they raided our, our uh, altar for God. We read about that in Kings. Uh, this is the kind of stuff, right? Bowls, ladles, jars, and jugs. So this is stuff made out of pure gold. It's is value, right? Now, you shall make a lampstand of pure gold, right? That is the menorah. Menorah is Ahav. The lampstand. And here's some very interesting descriptions of the menorah. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base and its shaft, its cups, its calyxes and petals shall be of one piece. Six branches shall issue from its sides, three branches from one side of the lampstand and three branches from the other side. So lest you think that you can put up a menorah, the menorah could have had seven branches on one side and then, no, it's right in the middle. And that is where the main, the main uh, shaft and base goes. And then the branches on its side, three on each side, right? One branch, and again, this is all the description of the menorah. On one branch, there shall be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and petals. And on, on the next branch, there shall be three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with calyx and petals. So for all six branches issuing from the lampstand. Isn't that why they call it a cup one on three? That's why we, exactly. Because it's not a menorah. Where is this menorah, though? Where's this menorah? Where's this menorah? Where's the menorah? Where's the? Have you ever have, have you ever seen a menorah like this? Yes. You see a menorah like they're just describing? Yeah. With the six three three one. Yeah. yeah. Right there. That's the Knesset menorah, which is a version of that. Now this has got an artistic representation of Jewish history on it, but it is closer in just in in style to what we have here described in the Torah which is that it's supposed to be one base piece with the sides coming out and that it's divided up like this with these different sections. Now, this is a version of that, right? That's not the, uh, that's not what the tabernacle menorah looked like because that one had clear almond blossoms. This is an artistic representation. So let me show you more of what that one looked like. That one looked like this, which is this type of style. But again, three on each side. These are calyxes. These are calyxes. And I guess that's a, a representation of almond blossoms. Uh, where do we have this? Where, where did it go? Well, we built one in the second temple. The first temple one, we don't know what happened to it. Uh, those ones were taken away by the by the Babylonians. The second temple also had a menorah, but the Romans took it. What? Do you think there's a secondary market black market on this antiquity or construction? Not for this one, because you know what we have on the Arch of Titus, right? <laughs> the Arch of Titus, right? This is the Arch of Titus in Rome. How do we know what? How do we know what was? Uh, Here's the spoils of Jerusalem that were taken. And there you can see, is it in the, is it in the uh, Vatican to this day? So here's the spoils of Jerusalem. These were what they took. It was Khan Academy. There you go. Let me just see if I can get to the, to the, uh, here it is. Here's the, there's our menorah getting taken away. See? No. Oh, Got to go back a little bit. This is what the menorah looked like by the time of the Romans. Hold it a second. There's, here it is. Okay. That's it. So there was a picture of it being taken to Rome. Okay? So it was taken to Rome. 
just so you know. We don't know what happened after that. Different theories about what happened to it. But we built a version of that. That was not this version of it because that was taken away by the Babylonians. But then we built a, a version of this that was also similar to that. And guess what? The Romans verified that. It was there, right? So the menorahs are Jewish symbol. So if you go to anywhere in the world, if you want to see where the Jews, how do we know Jews live someplace? It's because we found a menorah. Now it's a tough thing to draw. Somebody once said, you know what? The Christians had a big advantage over us. Their symbol is much easier to draw. <laughs> We had six. It's a tough one to draw. It is a tough one to draw, though. But we do find it carved everywhere. But it's a tough one to draw. There's a simplicity to. Here, I'll show you this. Though. There's a simplicity to. This is a picture that I took. I actually took this picture with my own phone. That was that was in Croatia. That was in the that was in the. Uh, oldest part of of uh, split the diocletian's palace and that's how we knew jews were there what, what is that a stone yeah it's carved into the wall this is diocletian's palace it's diocletian's palace and in there we found that from over two thousand years ago you know uh, that's how we know jews were there Look at that. Crazy. Crazy. So it's crazy. So yeah, it was not an easy thing to draw, but we did it. And you can see that this was this was um, the way we did it. The calyxes and their stems shall be one piece, the whole of it single hammered piece of pure gold. Make it seven lamps. The lamp shall be mounted as to give the light on its front side and its tongs and fire pans of pure gold. It should be made with all these furnishings out of a talent of pure gold. So that's pretty heavy. It's about 70, 80 pounds per talent, I think. I think. I'll look it up. Uh, note well and follow the patterns for them that are being shown you on the mountain. So that means that God gave Moses the plans for this when he was on Mount Sinai. That's what it says. So these descriptions are what one of the things he gets at Mount Sinai. So pretty specific. Very specific, right? And that's so people don't say, hey, where did my stuff go? And then, and then where did my seven, stuff go? For Thousands years. of years. At least, well, most people would say at least 2,700 years. So even if this wasn't written by Moses 3,200 years ago, it was written 2,700 years ago, 2,600 years ago. Maybe. So maybe it's that old. Maybe it's 3,000 years, but it's at least 2,600 years. And, and why would, like, look, they had, the, they had the, the temple. When this was written, they had a temple. So they could look up at the menorah that they had. And if it didn't match what they had here, why would they have described it that way? So I don't know. I, I mean, it, it, that's the, the, the youngest that it is, is 2,600 years. All right. So now we get into the tabernacle itself. Back to the tent. By that, I mean this thing. Let's get to the Mishkan. So this is... Now, the description. So what's interesting is we have a description first of the stuff that goes inside. And then we get a description of the house. So it's almost like, yes, I'm going to tell you what's in my house. I'm going to tell you what I have first. And then I'm going to tell you about the outside of the house. I'm going to tell you about the walls. That makes sense. Not a bad way of saying what's really important. And of course, what was the most expensive those things the treasures that were inside as but this is pretty nice stuff too as for the tabernacle make it of 10 strips of cloth make these of fine twisted linen blue purple and crimson yarn with a design of cruvim worked into them 
So the angels were in the garment too, right? Which is why when Mike said at the beginning, that doesn't look like the tabernacle. That doesn't look like it's the cloth. Now, this is, uh, well, it's not that important. Uh, yeah. Um, this isn't saying, this, this is why it's a T without a capital, why it's not a capital T, a lowercase T, is because this is actually the walls of it, not the, not the whole thing. So this is the tabernacle, like the ins and outs of the, of the tent, not the, the whole thing, which we, when we call it the tabernacle, we're talking about like the whole entity. So this is the design of, of this stuff. Okay. The length of each cloth shall be 28 cubits and the width of each cloth shall be four cubits. All the cloths to have the same measurements, which is again, 28 cubits is, you know, 30, 30, uh, over 35 feet, 40 feet almost. That's long. Five of the cloths shall be joined to one another, and the other five cloths shall be joined to one another. So those are the two sides, which is why when we do look at the dimensions of it, we can see that it's longer. Well, let's get to it. Make loops of blue wool on the edge of the outermost cloth of one set and do likewise on the edge of the outermost cloth on the other set. Make 50 loops on the one cloth and 50 loops on the edge of the end cloth of the other set, the loops to be opposite one another. And make 50 gold clasps and couple the cloths to one another with the clasps so that the tabernacle becomes one whole. You shall take, then take, make cloths of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Make the cloths 11 in number. The length of each cloth shall be 30 cubits and the width of each cloth shall be four cubits. 11 cloths to have the same measurement. So I will show you this. And this is what, again, you know, for the descriptions of what we have, this is the blue cloth for the thing inside. These are the blue cloths inside. This is the outer cloth, the tent cloth that they're describing. And this is the way that it's kind of nailed into the ground with rings that will, you know, pull the 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 um tent down so the tent doesn't actually touch the ground their tent there are there are 50 clasps around it and that's how it's tied to the ground so there's a tabernacle and then there's a cover over the tabernacle which is the way it's described which is again the over the kind of the over covering there um that's the the cloth the goat, the goat hair cloth over the tabernacle. So think about that as kind of a, what do they call that thing? And you put over your tent. What's that thing when you have a tent and you put a thing over the tent so it doesn't get wet? Canopy. What's that thing? RV? Canopy. What canopy? Yeah. Call it a canopy. Okay. But yeah, if you're a real professional tent person, try not. You're supposed to put a tent. You put a thing over your tent. I'm not making this up. I know because I got the tent. I had a tent once and there was that thing over it. I'm like, I'm not putting that up. I'm just putting the tent up. Don't give me something to put over the tent. What do I need this for? And they said, no, that's the way if it gets wet, it's going to go off the tent. Otherwise, your tent gets wet. Right? Harvey, you probably put up the canopy too, right? You're, you're, not, you're not messing around. But, no, we did. We used it in Yosemite. Yeah, and you put up the, you put up the canopy too, right? Correct. And that's because it does get wet. Like there, it gets wet no matter what because of the yeah. dew and stuff. There's a reason for it. It actually, there's, they don't just do it to make your work harder. But I didn't like it. I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do that canopy. What do I need the canopy for? I just want a tent. I used it one time. Anyways, uh, but it does make sense why you need the canopy. So they, it was for protection. The length of each cloth shall be 30 cubits and the width each, we said four, and 11 cloths the same measurement. Join the five cloths by themselves and the other six cloths by themselves and fold over the six cloth at the front of the tent. So that is the part that you saw that was open. Make 50 loops on the out edge of the outermost, outermost cloth of the one set and 50 loops on the edge of the cloth in the other set. Make 50 copper clasps and fit the clasps onto the loops and couple the tent together so that it becomes one whole. As for the overlapping axis of the cloths of the tent, 
The extra half cloth shall overlap the back of the tabernacle, while the extra cubit at the e either end of the length of the tent cloth shall hang down to the bottom of the two sides of the tabernacle and cover it and make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skin and a covering of dolphin skins above. You shall make the planks for the tabernacle. Oh, before we get to the tank, the, the, the planks and the, and this is the actual, when you see the tabernacle, that's the out, that's the whole thing. But let's get to this in a second. Hold it one second. Let me just show you one more time. So again, we're going to get to uh, the outer tent in a second. But again, this tent in here, you can see that uh, the cloth was doubled over. And in this case, again, this is like, you know, the entrance, the enter entrance and exit. I wonder if I have a picture which shows the backside of it too, but this one has the cover. This is like the final, this is a good picture of it because it's got the final, um, what, what it finally looks like. But let me just show you one other thing. No, no, no. That's all cloth. Hold it no, one no, second. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, that's dirt. No, no, this is all. They, they, that's why they, I showed you that picture because that was a full on, that's a full on, uh, and you can see it's some of the stuff that I've looked at lately. Man, it's crazy stuff. Looked at black Israelite, black Hebrew Israelite propaganda. Yeah, craziness. John, what are you going to say? Nothing. I'm scratching my head. You've got something on your mind. No? Oh, no. <laughs> all right so now that's here i'll show you one other picture oh that's kind of a cool one um so well we're going to get into this in a second but let me just show you a couple pictures so this is these are these are what this is what the the arc this is what the um there's the ark. There's the table. Oh yeah. I see one there. Yeah. So this old, old, old picture shows you. This is an old picture, right? But it shows you the ark there, not in the tabernacle. But this gives you kind of dimensions of what it looked like. It's kind of a cool picture. Um. Let me just see this. Here's another. Here's another picture of it. So this is what this is. I don't know if they put the. I don't like that picture, even though it's got a computer look to it. That's not really the covering of it. This one's still the best one. So. How old is that? This one. Yeah. I'm not sure. Hold it. I'll tell you. Let me see if I can find out how old this picture is. This was from Timna Valley. Let me see. I would think it would have been built up more of a oh. of a structure. How could that picture be from two days ago? Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. But you can see that's Timna Valley Park. Yeah. John, you were saying? Uh, you go back to that old picture that you had. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think it would be much more of a structure. I mean, a permanent? I see the one engine coming in from the back. Come on, it's a tent. You hop the fence and you're in. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, it wasn't that simple. They had there are priests all over the place. Oh, okay. There are priests that are that are checking you out the whole time. But th this show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is actually in Israel that somebody put this up in Timna. Wait a second. Is that, is that really right that somebody just put that up? Yeah, that was August 23. Pretty cool. No, it says 2007. 2007. So, but it's still pretty new. So Timna is is uh, in the southern, it's in near a lot. So it's in the desert. Anyways, you can get a good idea of, of like, you know, seeing what it kind of looked like in, a, in an environment that was similar to what it was, you know, similar to how it looked okay so so now it says for the planks right for the boards 
use acacia wood upright. The length of each plank shall be 10 cubits and the width of each plank a cubit and a half. Each plank shall have two tenons parallel to each other. Do the same with all the planks of the tabernacle. And again, uh, Harvey, you knew what a tenon was right away. Right? Harvey? I think you muted. Uh, Harvey, are you muted? I thought I was unmuted. I don't know what a tenon is, maybe under a different name. No, we, we, I, you, you went over this. I remember we talked about this before. Here's a tenon. It, it's, I thought it was, I thought you knew about this. This is from woodworking. Here, I'll show That's you. The wrong Harvey. Here, I'll show you. Here, here's, here's, it says hands. Mine says uh, projection, but then I look at the footnotes. It says um, hands, probably the two tenons at the bottom of each frame that were inserted into its two faces. Here's a picture of a tenon. No, not me. Oh, I thought it was you who knew this. So we, we discussed this a long time ago. So this is the style of, of if you do woodworking, you create a tenon, which is basically the wood, like the male part of it, and then it goes into a, something called a mortise. And this is a way to create uh, very strong connections between wood. And it's been used, it says, for thousands of years to create connections to wood. Uh, mainly, uh, you know, creates right angles. It says, there's strong and stable joints that can be used in many projects. They furnish a strong outcome and connect by either gluing or locking into place. The mortise and tenon joint also have a, a give attractive look, you know, because you don't see anything on the outside, right? So this is, a, a, it says, the one drawback to this joint is the difficulty in making it because of the precise measuring and tight cutting required. In its most basic form, a mortise and tenon joint is both simple and strong. There are many variations. And here it is again, right here. That's a, that's a tenon. Yes. So here's the way a tenon would look like. Yes. And so this is, uh, this is people have been doing tenons for a long time. Here's actually an Egyptian style tenon. So you can see this is from even earlier. The stuff lasts though. So that's what a tenon is. It is the uh, style of woodworking that creates that, that creates that, um, that creates that joint. They didn't have nails and screws? No, no, but it created a really good, uh, good solid way of having it to, uh, to, to then take it out. Of the planks of the tabernacle, make 20 planks on the south side and making 40 silver sockets under the 12, 20 planks, two sockets under the one plank for its tenons and two sockets under each following plank for its two tenons. So each plank had two tenons in it, which is even more work. Because you can't just put one tenon in it, you had to put two. So those are, um, and on the other side of the wall of the tabernacle on the north side, 20 planks. With their 40 so silver sockets, two sockets under one under the one plank and two sockets under each following plank. And as for the rear of the tabernacle to the west, make six planks. And of the two planks for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear, they shall match at the bottom and terminate alike at the top inside one ring. Thus shall it be with both of them. They shall form two corners. There shall be eight planks with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under the first plank and two sockets under each of the other. I told you it's detailed. Yes, you shall make the bars of acacia wood, five for the planks of one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the planks of the other side of the wall of the tabernacle and five bars for the planks on the wall of the tabernacle at the rear of the, of the west. The center bar halfway up the plank shall run from end to end. Overlay the planks with gold and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. Then set up the tabernacle according to the manner of you were shown on the mountain. You shall make a curtain of purple, blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen. And again, shall have the design of Kruvim worked in it. Hang upon it four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and having hooks of gold set in four sockets of silver. 
hang the curtain under the clasp and carry the ark of the pact there behind the curtain so that the curtain shall serve as a partition between the holy and the holy of holies. And that is the, that is the innermost part which we showed before, which is kind of the difference between this part. Um, Thirty is like one of the most important lines. Which is, hold it, hold it. Uh, so that's the outside, and then if we look in the inside, oh wait, it's colorful. Color. Yeah, th th this 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 is, you know, this gives you. Uh, oh, hold it one second. Um, yeah. I can't show from that. Sorry. Um, so that is um let me just go back to this one right here so 30 let's go back there so set up the tabernacle according to the manner of what you were shown on the mountain yeah so we saw that line we saw a version of that line already which is again these directions are given to god to given by god to moses at at, at mount sinai so this is the this is the, um, this is what they, you know, this is what he's got to do. And again, I don't know why that's still showing this picture. Um, yeah, that is the, um, Place the table un, outside the curtain and the lamb stand by the south wall of the tabernacle out, opposite the table, which is placed by the north wall. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen done in embroidery. Make five posts of acacia wood for the screen and overlay them with gold and their hooks being of gold and cast them for, with five sockets of copper. So again, this is all, I guess the one thing that I was going to show you is in... If they make this exactly like that, it's going to cost a lot. Well, yeah, I don't think that they're going to necessarily, um, I don't think they're going to essentially, you know, use gold for it all because, yeah, that's going to be very expensive. Um, so let me just show you what it look would have looked like inside the tabernacle. So this is a good, this is a good um, display of, this is a good display of, hold it, here, I'll show you this, this is, um, there's the menorah, there's the showbread, there's the altar inside, the inner altar, this is the curtain we just heard about, which separates the holy area. And then back here is the Holy of Holies, which is where yeah, the Ark is. And what's behind that? What? No, no, to your, to your left. Yeah, right there. There? That's, just a, that's the back of it. That's just wood and then yeah. cloth. Yeah, and that's the description of what we had, which there are the planks. No, there is no, no back way out. That's why it's... Yeah, no, it, there's no back way out. This is the front. This is where the people would walk through. And then based on, again, the amount of planks that they had, you have actually four rows of planks. There's a top plank here. And then these are the sockets and the poles that go through there. So you can imagine this had to be taken up, set down every time they moved. But this is the Holy of Holies back here. So once you, only the priest could go back here. Only the high priest, the Kohen Gadol can go back here. So the rest of the priests could come in here. Some of them would go outside. And again, here's the, here's the, Here's the uh, tabernacle wall, or, or whatever, the wall, the tent wall, if you will. You can see it on that side. Here it's opened up. So you can see the planks in here. And these are, again, tenons. These are done by the wood being carved so that you can put the, the wood down in the, in the base of, the, of that wood. And then here's the covering. So there's actually, you can see it says one, one cover is the actual cover that is part of the tabernacle. Then there's the other garment that was on outside and then on top of it was another garment which was the outer protection the the dolphin skin this is um you can see the layers of cloth that were there 
They said the frame structure was covered by four layers of cloth and skins. I guess if you if you include the inner cloth and then the cloth there, and then the out, this, this is the, the canopy we were saying is one layer and then another layer. So yeah, it's, it's it was you know quite it a- like camouflage, if you think about it, not that- What? They have the, the over the top, the top ones. Like oh, I guess, yeah. Blends in with the sand. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's also again very um, there's a lot of protection, Weather. right? Good protection for the for the for this so that it could stay pure. So again, you would have seen a lot of gold when you went in. But here's the cruvine, the embroidery of the cruvine in the blue, crimson. It says blue, crimson, and purple garments. So this is their version of it. But there's the menorah. Yeah, and so there's that's that's what you would have seen in the tabernacle inside the tabernacle. So the one that you are showing in that picture mm -hmm. is it open to the public? Oh, that one? I'm not sure. I don't. I I don't know if the one in. I'll ask if the one in Timna is is open to the public, whether people can go in. But I'm not sure that they actually. I'm not sure if they actually have that stuff like always there. I mean, it could be, it could be, but I don't. I mean be kind of cool i bet you people would want to see it but i know they have <laughs> i know there's i know there's a, a reconstruction of the of the temple in jerusalem the 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 beit hamikdash the the temple not the tabernacle but they might have a tabernacle there too it's in orlando it's right by disney world it's actually right by universal there's a yeah there's a bible there's a bible theme park let me just show you I don't know what it's called. It's uh, yeah. It's it's uh yeah. It's um. What's it called? I I, I mean, it was it was in business before. It's called. Uh, here it is. It's kind of. I don't know. I I just know that it's there. Here it's called the Holy Land Experience. And it's a Christian-based theme park. Um. So it's owned by Trinity Broadcasting. So here's their, here's their, uh, they have a, but that's a model. They actually have a, whoa, they actually have a thing there. Um, oh, wait, it closed in 2020. Yeah, I thought, I thought it might, I, I thought it, I thought it, yeah. It, I, I didn't think it was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it, uh, it didn't, it didn't, it's, it, it's owned by Advent Health now. Yeah, I don't think it did that well. It didn't do that well. But um, yeah. So um, yeah, it didn't work. None of these places have done very well. They have one, they had Heritage USA, which was what Pat, I mean, uh, what's his name? Oh. The guy, Jim Baker. Jim Baker's was Heritage USA. This was the one that he built, which I think then got taken over by somebody else. And then this was Jim Baker's one. But they, but they did, I don't think they had a temple there. They might have. Actually, they had a Jerusalem amphitheater, but they didn't have. Um, I, don't, I, don't wanna, I didn't want to get into that. But people, yes, people have tried to build things like this, and they usually don't do very well. Um, people want to see the. They don't, I don't know. It doesn't live up to their expectations, I don't think. So let's let's uh, read a little bit more because we're going to, as I said, we're going to kind of go through this a little faster. That was, by the way, that was 37 verses. So you should, I, I, I know. I get it for some people. Yeah. But, but if you haven't read it. For the first time. Yes. Oh, it is very detailed, right? Sorry. You shall make the, yes, well, that's why we're reading it. The reason that we're reading it is because some people have not read this. You shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long. By the way, this is not an easy portion if you have it for your bar mitzvah, though. <laughs> now, these are tough. These are tough ones. So, you know what we concentrate on? Bring to God what your heart, what moves your heart, right? Make a place for God to dwell. Notice that those two verses came from the first eight lines of the portion. <laughs> no, it gets harder. It gets harder. No, but, you know, look, unless the kid is really crafty, you know, unless the kids, maybe the kid's a Boy Scout and he likes to build, make tents. He, like that. he might like that. He might get into that. 
I think it's happened once or twice. We've had Boy Scouts that have kind of gotten into the tent, but yeah, it's not, it's tough. Uh, so you shall make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, right? This is the altar, which we saw. We saw the picture of the altar. Five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar is to be square and three cubits high. Now we heard before in Exodus, it says you're supposed to make an altar out of stone. Now we have a, our, the altar that we make. Probably again, because it would be very hard to build an altar and move it every time. Out of rock. All those stones. It wouldn't work. So this is a different kind of altar. Right. It's also very hard to make an altar that is going to stand up to fire, which is why this altar, because it's an altar, you know, where we're going to burn stuff on, is made of copper, which is much better for burning. Make its horns on the four corners. The horns are to be one piece with it and overlay it with copper. Make the pails for removing its ashes, as well as its scrapers, basins, flesh hooks, and fire pans. Make all of its utensils, utensils of copper. Much better for the heat, right? Yes. Make it for it great a grating of meshwork, or meshwork in copper. And on the mesh, make four copper rings at its four corners. Set the mesh below under the ledge of the altar so that it extends to the middle of the altar. And make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with copper. The poles shall be inserted into the rings so that the poles remain on the sides of the altar when it was carried. Also carried. Make it hollow of boards as you were shown on the mountain. So shall they be made. You shall make the enclosure of the tabernacle on the south side, a hundred cubits of hangings of fine linen twisted. Now, what does it say right here? Uh, well, still connected to the thing we read earlier. You shall make the enclosure of the tabernacle. So now we're back to, uh, yeah, all this is the altar until here. You shall make the enclosure of the tabernacle on the south side. So this is the outer stuff that we saw. The outer enclosure, whoops. On the outer enclosure, you're supposed to make a hundred cubits of hanging of fine twisted linen for the length of the enclosure on that side. That's the part that Mike said, why is it white? Because that part's in linen, the outer part. This is not the tabernacle itself. This is the enclosure of the whole tabernacle, of the whole area, which is why it is capital T. Because when they talk about the tabernacle in its totality, with everything, it's T. When they're talking about that inner thing that we saw, then that's the lower case T. Uh, again, 100, 100 cubits of hangings for its length on the north side. So on the north and south side, there's both 100, 100 cubits with its 20 posts and their 20 sockets of silver, the hooks and bands of posts to be of silver. For the width of the enclosure on the west side, 50 cubits of hangings with their 10 posts and their 10 sockets. And again, to help people think about what that looks like, it looks like a rectangle. Yes. That is the outer enclosure, this part right here. 100 cubits by 50 cubits. It's a rectangle. That is what we're talking about. Uh, for the width of the enclosure on the front, on the east side, 50 cubits. 15 cubits of hangings on one flank with their three posts and their three sockets. 15 cubits on the other flank with their posts and three sockets, which again would give us an area for people to walk into, right? Because on the back side, it says you just make you make 50 cubits, right? So on the on the west side, there's 50 cubits, 10 posts, 10 sockets, right? So that means every five cubits, there's a post. But on the front side, which is the east side, the side that you come in on, it says you have 15 cubits on one side, again, with three posts. So every five feet, every five cubits, there's a post. And then you have one on the other side, which again is 15 on the other side, which means that there's 15 cubits or whatever, if there's 20 cubits in the middle that's open. That can be open. So. Uh, and for the gate of the enclosure, a screen of 20 cubits, that's the this gate of the enclosure, so the 20 cubits in the, in the middle, 
uh, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns and fine twisted linen done in embroidery with their four posts and their four sockets. So the middle section of 20 on that front side was a special gate, if you will, a special opening. That was the sha'ar. That was the opening. Okay. All the posts around the enclosure shall be banded with silver and their hooks shall be silver and their sockets shall be of copper. The length of the enclosure shall be 100 cubits and the width 50 throughout and the height five cubits with hangings of fine twisted linen. The socket shall be of copper. So it's five cubits high, seven and a half feet. Should be like that. Yeah. You want to make it out of linen? <laughs> no, we don't want it to be of linen. That's a little too literal. I don't want it to be of linen unless that linen is... Are made out of silver and then the other are, are copper. Copper, yeah. The length of the enclosure is a uh, hundred cubits. So again, on each side it's a hundred, and then the the width is fifty. So it's about one hundred and fifty feet long, seventy five feet wide. That's how big the inner area is, like the inside, and then the and then the tabernacle. The actual tent is inside of that shall be of copper right and all of the utensils of the tabernacle for all its service as well as its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be of copper and that is the way that portion ends but we're not going to end there we're going to go into tetzave which sometimes is read with truma it's sometimes read as a joint portion because now we get into some details and so we're going to finish up with these details yes and by the way the christians didn't end it here which is why it starts here in verse 20, the next chapter. Yes. I've read it. And that's pretty, not truly really amazing question. Yes. Was it meant to be mobile? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, how often did they move it? You know, they didn't move it every day. No. They didn't move it every month in some cases. They didn't even move it every year. There were years where it was in the same place. So they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah, but years and years and years. And so if you think about it, they moved, I think they had like 25, 30 stops. So if you think about it, if you divided it up and it's not divided up like that, that it would be about once a year. Now it's not because some years they moved a few times well, the first couple of years, they moved a lot. And then they got to where they were supposed to go. And then we're going to read in numbers how they messed up. And then they stopped. So for most of the 40 years, they didn't really move it. There was a good chunk of time that they were only in one place. They were in Kadesh for a long time. And then, I mean, so they didn't move. We'll get to the, we have, by the way, we get to it in numbers. The locations that they went to we actually have a, a place by place recounting of where they went to so it was mobile it was not easy to set up and we actually have a numbers a description of how they divided up the work for setting it up but yeah it was definitely mobile but it but there was a level to it where it was obviously very intensive the labor that went into this so it was mobile, but it was not meant to be done every day. What I'm going to tell you is that there is a theory that it was in the, if not the tabernacle, a version of the tabernacle was inside the temple in Jerusalem when it was built by Solomon. That Solomon recreated this space in the temple. And when he built it, because he wanted to have a connection between the tabernacle, because we know the ark was there. But there's a bigger question, which is was the Beit HaMikdash, the actual Holy of Holies in that inner area that he built, right? The first temple that Solomon built, Solomon's temple, was it actually a space for the tabernacle? We don't know for sure, but it is possible that if it wasn't meant to, if it wasn't meant to actually house what was left of the tabernacle, 
than it was meant to represent what was the tabernacle, what the tabernacle was. So that's the last time that we saw that the ark was there, and that's the last time we've seen Hmm. No, the Babylonians did, or it was taken before that by the Egyptians, ah. which is why in Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's in <laughs> Egypt, that they took it. Now, we talked about it in our Tuesday morning class. There is also the theory, the not the theory, the story that the Ethiopians have it. They believe they have it, but nobody else besides the Ethiopians believe they have it. They, according to their story, they had a, they had a, they were supposed they to have the, re, they were supposed to have the replica. Yeah, they haven't shown it. They have, they were supposedly had the replica of the ark that Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba. But according to the story, they actually took the original one and left the replica. It's a great story because it means that the other one's not, the original one isn't lost. They have it, but they won't show. It. They won't show it. No. So, don't know. Don't know. All right, let's read this last chapter here now. So this portion begins about you shall further command, or in here it's instruct, but the word means fire. You shall further instruct the Israelites to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling lamps regularly. So now we're really getting into the details, not just of what's going to be built, but what is going to be used for the things that you build. So these are now the directions for um, I don't know if you will. These are the instructions for the great things that you have inside your house. Like how to use the oven, how to turn on the remote, how to use your television. All those great things. This is now how to use the us other stuff. The stuff that you have. Aaron and his son shall sh set them up in the tent of mean outside the curtain, which is over the ark of the pack to burn from evening to morning before Adonai. It shall be a due from the Israelites for all time throughout the ages. Uh, interestingly enough, that's the way it ends. The chapter ends in, in the way Christian scholars brought it up. Uh, we didn't break it there, but here, however you want to look at it, the next chapter the next verse says you shall bring forward your brother aaron with all his sons from among the israelites to serve me as priests aaron nadav avihu elazar and Idamar, the sons of aaron so well, now we know who the people are that's who the people who are going to work in this place aaron and his sons and he has four of them to start with i say to start with because he doesn't end with four sons he starts with four sons Make sacral, sacral, or sacral vestments for your brother Aaron for dignity and adornment. Now we get down to the details of what they wear. Next, you shall instruct all who are skillful, whom I've endowed with the gift of skill, to make Aaron's vestments for consecrating him to serve me as priests. These are the vestments they are to make. A breast, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a fringe tunic, a headdress, and a sash. They shall make those sacral, sacral vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons for priestly service to me. They therefore shall receive the gold, the blue, the purple, the crimson yarns, and the fine linen. They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, of fine twisted linen worked into designs. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached, and they shall be attached at its two ends. And the decorated band that is upon it shall be made like of one piece of it of gold, of blue, purple, crimson yarns, and of fine twisted linens. Then take two lazuli stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six on the names on one stone and six on the names of the remaining six on the other, in order of their birth. Of On the two stones you shall make seal engravings, the work of a lapidary, of the names of the sons of Israel, having bordered them with frames of gold, Attach the two stones to the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones for remembrance of the Israelite people, whose names Aaron shall carry upon his two shoulders, pieces for remembrance of, the, of Adonai. So let us now describe what we just saw in a picture. Because does your book there, Glory, have a picture? It does not. 
How does it translate the word ephod? And what does it say the ephod is? Um, <laughs> what does yours say? What does yours say? John? The word is not explained further, probably because the ephod was a familiar item. It was a kind of pinafore composed of two pieces of linen joined at the shoulder by straps. Yeah. Not the least except originally from a loin cloth. Mine also says in my footnotes a sleeveless vestment worn by the high priest. Sometimes the word refers to an otherwise unidentified object of worship. Yeah, which is why it means we don't translate it. Because <laughs> we don't know exactly what it looks wow. like. Oh, so so the reason I didn't show it yet, or I wasn't going to show it yet, is because we've only had the description of the ephod. So this is maybe what the ephod was, this kind of under apron, um, which is attached here and there's stones up here. This is not the breastplate. We haven't gotten to it yet. The ephod is what has been described as here, here. Um, I, I do, because we don't believe we're supposed to do this because we don't know exactly what we're doing. So, and, to, and to make sure we don't do this, we don't do it. And, and, and it is a serious issue because there, 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 yes, there are Orthodox Jews who say, well, maybe we should try to figure out how to do this. Most people say you absolutely don't do it, which is why, again, we don't even make a talit with a blue fringe. Now, some people do. I, I have seen them. I'm not going to say nobody has it, but 99% of the talis you're going to find don't have a blue fringe on them. They don't. They have blue in the talis, right? Or the whatever color in the talis. But the blue in the talis, as we said, like the blue, you know, like on the Israeli flag, is to remind us that there was a blue fringe. But we don't know what the blue fringe looked like exactly. And so the rabbi said, we don't mess around. We don't want to make it wrong. So because we don't know exactly what this looks like, these are illustrations. You'll find lots of different illustrations. There, I'll show you a different, completely different way of, of looking at the ephod. Here's a different ephod. Here's a, well, hold a second. Let me get this down. Here's another description of the ephod. Here's another description of the ephod. Here's another description of the ephod. So, the yeah, well, I haven't gotten to that yet. That's why I was going to wait because, yeah, the breastplate is definitely the, the choshen, as we call it, the Hebrew word for the breastplate is very, very descriptive and very, must have been very dramatic. We're going to finish with that today. But, um, but here is, is the, where the stones were that had the names of the, uh, of the, here's what it says, the stones of memorial in a setting of gold. You can't see them very well, but this is what we just had described, which are the stones that have six of the tribes on one side and six of the tribes on the other. And then we have the Chosh and Mishpat, the, we haven't gotten to the breastplate, which has four rows of stones and settings of gold. So this is the ethode. Again, maybe, maybe it says that there were pomegranates and bells on their ends, right? Um, but yeah, we don't know exactly why, which is why we don't mess around with it. The rallies were pretty pretty solid about that, which is don't make things that you don't know how to do, which is why we don't make incense. Because the, 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 we're going to read about this incense where we had, but we don't know what it was like. And so we don't do it. Now you can go to, we'll see when we go to Israel, they have, they'll, every like gift store, in Christ, especially the Christian sections, will have these biblical incense. We don't know that it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to do it. Bible says that kind of what's in it. We think we don't know the, we don't know the proportions. proportions, right? We don't know. You don't want to mess around with that. It's like messing around with some medicine, right? You're not right. going to. Oh, I think that there was sulfide in it, but I'm not sure how much. <laughs> not sure how much is in there. You die. You wind up dying, as you're going to see. You can wind up dying if you mess around the wrong way. So those are the stones. Uh, Make the frames of gold and two chains of pure gold. Braid those like corded work and fasten the corded chains to the frames. And here is the breastplate, the breast piece of decision. I don't like that translation. What does your translation say, Glory? It's called the Choshen Mishpat. Fashion and the breast piece for making decisions. Yeah. Breastplate of decision. That's fine. What does yours say, Mary? 
Yeah, I like judgment. I like judgment a little bit better. I like judgment better. So it's the, well, let's look. This is the breastplate of decision or the Hoshen Mishpat. Worked into design, make it in the style of the ephod, make it of gold, of blue, of purple, and crimson yarns, and of fine twisted linen. It shall be square and doubled, a span in length and a span in width. Set it at mounted stones and four rows of stones. The first row shall be a row of carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and amethyst. Now, we're not sure exactly of all these translations, which is why glory yours might be a little different. What does it say? Are we all, are we all on the same one? There's no way we're still, we're not 100% on yours for sure. For the first row? Yeah. Uh, rubies, topaz, and beryl. Yeah, not even close. No. Not even close. Because, yeah, the only one we can really be sure of is this one. Sapir. Well, that's a Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word, Joanne. You got it. Sapphire is a Hebrew word. It's a Semitic word. It's an Arabic and Hebrew word. That's the only one we can absolutely be sure of, which is why it's the only one it's got. So interestingly, the Choshen Mishpat is the breastplate of judgment. It's actually one of the tractates of Jewish law we have. It's called the Choshen Mishpat. They kept the, the name alive as, the, as a way of thinking about the way the priests had it, which was a little bit easier than we have it. Why? Well, we'll get to that. Uh, it says a, 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 a jacinth, an agate, and a crystal. And the fourth row is a barrel, lapis lazuli, and jasper. And they shall be framed with gold in their mountings. So that one's probably pretty close to the same ones. Do you have those lapis, barrel? What do you have there, Lori? Uh, let's see, third row. Fourth, fourth. Fourth. Oh, fourth row. Um, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. Hmm. So they don't have they don't have the lapis in there. That's interesting. Beryl is probably uh, that. We use these words, by the way. Some of these words still make it into um, into uh, Hebrew or into uh, modern times because sometimes these people have these names. There's people whose names are Shoham. Uh, and there are people whose names are, uh, well, I'm trying to see if there's any other ones that you would have heard people have these names. Because they'd have these names as jewels. It means they were somewhat important or they're beautiful, right? I think of a word that you would have seen here in Hebrew, somebody's name that you would know. Well, sapphire, anybody named Shapiro, that's a, a version of sapphire. But Shoham is a name that you'll sometimes see. Um, I'm trying to think of any of these names. Yos Yo Yoshaf. These are more Middle Eastern names, but th there are people who have these names all, all across the Middle East because uh, like Leshem. Are there replicas of, of these rest, like yeah. management around? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so people still have these names because they're, you know, they're, they're valuable stones. The stone shall correspond in the numbers to the names of the sons of Israel. Twelve corresponding to their names. They shall be engraved like seals, each with its name for the twelve tribes. On the breastplace, breastpiece, make braided chains of corded work in pure gold. Make two rings of gold on the breastpiece and fashion the two rings at the two ends of the breastpiece, attaching the two golden cords to the two rings on the ends of the breastpiece. So it's attached. That's why it showed in that picture before. It's not just hanging there. It's actually attached to the garment. Then fasten two ends of the cords to the two frames, which you shall attach to the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front. Make two rings of gold and attach them to the two ends of the breast piece at its inner edge, which faces the ephod. And make two other rings of gold and fasten them on the front of the ephod, low on the shoulder pieces, close to its seam above the decorated band. The breast piece shall be held in place by a cord of blue from its rings to the rings of ephod, so that the breast piece rests on the decorated band and does not come loose from the ephod. Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel on the breast piece of decision over his head when he enters the sanctuary for remembrance before Adonai at all times. Mm -hmm. Inside the breast piece of decision, you shall place the Urim and Tumim. Now, the breast piece, it says, will have the names of all the sons of Israel on it. And by having that, 
you will have a way of being connected to all the tribes, which is why on our breast piece, the Torah, which definitely can be polished today. So when you asked, wow, when beautiful Joyce just asked. Do we have any versions of that? Yes, almost every synagogue has a breast piece of a Torah, has a breastplate. That's one of the things that people get for ornamented for a uh, Torah. And oftentimes on those ornaments, there will be the 12 tribes. And sometimes they'll even have stones if you want to get real fancy. And so those have the names of the tribes. Somebody donated it. Somebody wanted it. Donate a breastplate because we didn't have one for the Torahs. So sometimes they'll have the crowns and the crowns on the Torahs will be oftentimes rimonim. They'll be pomegranates to remind us of those things, the bells and the pomegranates that were on the, on the priest. But this will also then have the, the 12 tribes. And it says inside of that, you'll also have the Urim and Tumim. And this is where we're going to finish today. Um, even though we're not at the end of the chapter. We're going to end here because this is a good place for us to, uh, the end of this is going to be right here. So these are symbols on the, the 12 tribes. 12 tribes. Those are the 12 tribes. Awesome. Yeah, that's the symbol based on the, so the thing that we're showing everybody is around the synagogue right now, which you can't see, is the breastplate of the tribes. And so, a lot of Torah breastplates will have, um, they will have, um, you'll see this, well, this is, this is probably actually more of a Christian, I bet you this is a Christian site, yeah, this is a Christian uh -huh. site, well, this is just Etsy, but there you have them with the different stones with the different tribes on them, right? So you have the names of the tribes with their stone by them. And so according to the Midrash, whenever you have the Choshen Mishpat, when you have the Choshen, when you have the Choshen Mishpat, you would have the, um, if there was a problem with one of the tribes, the, um, it would light up. So if one of the tribes was in, was it had a problem, the stone would light up for the tribe. It would what? The, tri the, the tribe's stone would light up if there was a problem. Yeah. God would send a message through the stone. So here's what ours looks like, right? That's, that's, but there's other versions of it. Here's a, or a breastplate with that. There's different. And then you can see that these other ornaments that sometimes people put on the Torah. Um, so sometimes they have crowns, right? Sometimes there'll be crowns. But these are all versions of, these are all versions of these of these things. And here's here's another version of it with the with the tribes. Well, there's the tribes with the stones underneath. But the last thing I want to show you is the Urim and Tumim. And these we don't even know what they were. We, you know, some people say they look like this. Uh, some people they, they look like this. These, you know. According to this, maybe they just had the alf, the Aleph bet. Aleph is the first letter, and Toph is the is the last letter. Somehow these were used to get decisions from God, which is why people try to figure out what they were. But we don't know what they were. We don't know what they were. We don't know what they look like, and that's why we kind of these are all guesses. Yeah, these are all um, these are all guesses, and we don't know. We don't know what they look like, but we do we do use them as a symbol for knowledge and trying to understand stuff. And why is this relevant, my friends? So you may not have heard of this university. That's Yale University's logo. Oh, oh my God. And in Hebrew, in Hebrew, it has the words Urim and Tumim on the coat of arms. This is on every Yale official university stuff. Now, it also says below it, lux et veritas, which means light is truth, but it also has in Hebrew, the primary symbol oh is in God. Hebrew. 
So that is the coat of arms of Yale. And look at every picture of Yale University as Urim and Tumim. That starts from the last letter. Yeah, so the first letter is Aleph, right? And then the last letter is Taf, right? And so the words themselves mean light, or, or means light, right? Or means light, and tomb or tom means purity. So the words themselves do mean something, but they clearly are not, they're clearly are not that. That's not right. what, it, that's not what it is, right? What, what it is, is, is what, what it, here, I'll, I'll show you, uh, here, you know, I'll just show you an example. So it says, it says right here, this is what we'll finish with that you can have nightmares about, not nightmares, but dreams about, uh, you know, it, it says, um, uh, you know, purity or innocence, but, you know, light and perfection, whatever you want to call it, revelation, that's, those aren't really good, but it says right here, the, we have one example of the Orim and Tumim being used and it somehow they were used, and here we read this story for those who are reading Samuel with us, the story of David and Jonathan. It says uh, they used the Urim and Tumim to figure out who is responsible when Jonathan screwed up and decided he wanted to go into battle without permission. They did the they did the they did the Urim and Tumim uh -huh. and they and they um, found out who was responsible. It was Jonathan. And remember, Saul had said, I'm going to kill who's ever responsible. And it turned out it was his own son. Wow. So um, let me just see if. Uh, Did he really kill him? No. Oh. But they both died together. Oh. Uh, so um, here, let me just get to the line. Uh, uh, let's see. Let me get to the line. Mm. Yeah, what does your footnote say? Um, the Hebrew for this phase probably means the curses and perfections. The Hebrew word, um, um, whatever, the ermin, Urim, uh -huh. uh, begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, mm -hmm. and then it begins with the last letter. They were sacred lots and were often used in times of crisis to determine the will of God. It has been suggested that if Ernan dominated when the lots were cast, the answer was no. But if Thuman dominated, it was yes. In any event, their every decision was from the Lord. Yeah, so we don't know. The point is, is that some people, here's the one time that it was used when Saul, when they used it to find Saul, yeah. cast lots between him and his son, and Jonathan was taken. So look, people say, it was like a divine eight ball, except the problem is, remember the divine, the eight ball, right? You, you give you an answer, yeah. except the thing is, is that there's only two, there was only, if there are only two things, if there are only two things, an A and a T, whatever you want to call it, A and a Z, that's the better one to use because it's A, it's A and Z. So the right. first letter and the last letter, if it was only those two things, then you would only get either a yes or no answer. It couldn't give you 20 different answers. It gave you one answer. There's another possibility, by the way, that's been put forward by other people, that it, each one of those dice had 12 letters on them. Oh. And you could roll them. They were uh -huh. like decahedron dice. Uh -huh. They have those, by the way, in Dungeons and Dragons. They have de decahedron dice. You roll them out, and you can get different combinations of two letters. Half the letters were on the Hebrew alphabet, 24 letters. Half of them were on one, and half of them were on the other. So you could actually get a, a combination of letters. We don't know. This is why it's never translated. It only just says Orm and Tumi. I mean, everybody would have known what it was, but we don't know what it was. And we're not supposed to try to know what they are, which is another thing. Again, we don't try to make things, for, we, we don't have them. Right. And so we don't have them. We're not supposed to try to make them. Those pictures that I showed you were done by people who were, experimenting or playing around i'm not saying you shouldn't do it but we don't do it we traditionally don't do it and we don't we don't try to do it so i don't know 
It's zeros and ones. It's binary code. Folks, I will only tell you, these are mysteries and you're not supposed to try to do them. Anyways, I, think about it though. Dream about it. All right, everybody. We'll see you later. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Take Good care. Night. Thanks. Bye-bye. 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 Good night. I tried to get through everything, but I didn't.